So welcome, Marco, for uh, the third of your trilogy. And uh, I think today you'll be speaking with us about contemplative techno science. So thank you. We listen. Thank you, Father Lawrence. Yes, uh, in the in the first two talks of this series, I have considered the three aspects, three dimensions of this phenomenon that we call intelligence, and which we are giving so much importance in our techno scientific societies. And I have called these dimensions, these three sorts of intelligence, the functional intelligence, the axiological intelligence, and the liberating intelligence. And technoscience, being a product of human intelligence, is the result of all these three dimensions. However, it is mainly the, the functional aspect which is given predominance over the other two, as we focus on the analytical problem-solving activity of technoscientific practice, or knowledge, on the knowledge it produces, and the technological application it, it yields. Still, the axiological and liberating dimensions are an integral part of human intelligence when pushing forward our, our techno-scientific techno activity. Then I also <clears throat> talked about how scientific practice itself is, at its core, a genuine spiritual practice, vocation, awe and wonder, silence and attention, patience and perseverance, care, communication and sharing, trust and respect, community, service and humility, openness to transformation, all these qualities are part of the experience of scientific inquiry. But instead of fostering these qualities, actual we said that actual technoscientific practice today makes it uh, very difficult to carry out scientific research that is faithful to these core values. And uh, this is a problem for the healthy deployment of the knowledge and services produced by the, by the techno sciences. Actually, it is a risk to tackle today's challenges with a highly developed functional intelligence, but with a shallow axiological and liberating intelligence. Because the, the result we get is, for example, very powerful machine encodable functional intelligence at the service of big technology companies that aim at ever increasing economic benefits to the expense of a ruthless extraction of behavioral data from as many of our human activities as possible. And to this threat to the freedom of human creativity, we need to add the threat to our ecosystems which the global digitization and algorithmification process only worsens. So how can we make certain that the fruits of science and technology become a true witness of human well-being and of, of great respect for all life forms and the environment? I think first and foremost, what we need is to recover the contemplative dimension that is already at the core of techno-scientific practice. So we need to tackle today's challenges by a healthy and balanced application of our human intelligence in all its dimensions. To further, to further reflect on, on how to achieve this, 
and how to bring forth a contemplative technoscience, it, it might be useful to go back in my first talk, namely that technoscientific is the product of human intelligence. And I will be, I will be following the thought of my friend and colleague, Jaume Agusti, and I will distinguish five aspects or five powers of this intelligence. First, uh, we have that whenever we apply our intelligence, we, we do so in some direction, with some motivation, with some purpose or intention. This is the power of interest. It can be just sheer curiosity. It can be, it can be an interest directed to oneself, self-interest or it can be egocentric or ethnocentric interest. But this interest can also go, go beyond the ego, beyond the ethno, and even beyond uh, the anthropocentric levels and, and gain and attain a level of gratuitous, unconditional love towards all lives, uh, all life forms and, and all sentient beings. Second, we have that the intelligence does not, does not flourish without the power of communication. Language is an, a very important aspect of human intelligence, but it's not the only one. Uh, gesture and silence are important components too. And, and again, there are many degrees of communication from just the transmission of, of information as done by, by the information and communication technologies, all the way to sincere trust and silent communication and silent communion. Third, we have that intelligence does not arise in isolation. I have already mentioned that, in, that it is misleading to attribute intelligence to individual entities, be they persons, animals, plants, or even machines. Intelligence arises in cooperation, in sharing. And this, this cooperation can be structured in a very hierarchical way, as have been done in the past, or it or it can take more dynamic and holoarchic shapes with decentralized forms of governance following, let's say, the principle of subsidiarity as, as needed for today's societies. Ultimately, this power of cooperation can become a true subsidiary symbiosis, a union in love and in service. Fourth, uh, we have that intelligence requires research, inquiry, asking us questions, looking for answers. We do this all the time. The Latin word for inquiry is indagare, which means to follow the track of an animal, literally to lead the prey into an enclosure. This has been an essential power of human survival, and it, is, and it still is. We need to search and, inquiry and, and inquire constantly into the death of things, to frame our experience in contextual systems, but to keep these systems open to be changed by new research in order to live in our ever-changing natural and cultural environments. And this research it reaches its highest degree when it is undertaken collectively in a generalized manner for the good of all humanity. And last but not least, there is the power of liberation and the most important of the powers of intelligence. Due to it, we can create models of reality we can detach from the immediacy of our experience and, and make the necessary abstractions 
for carrying out our techno-scientific practice. It is also our capacity to put our values aside when studying a particular phenomenon. A well-nourished and well-nourished, it allows us to detach from that which is relative to the ego. It frees us from desires, from expectations, fears, and suffering. It frees us from domination and exploitation. And since this power of liberation originates from reality's creative freedom itself, it puts us in touch with this fundamental creative freedom. A useful symbol for these five powers of intelligence, interest, communication, symbiosis, research, and liberation, is that of our head. Our body instrument of action and creation. With the index finger for interest, the middle finger for communication, the ring finger for symbiosis, and the little less exercised finger for research. And the thumb, standing for the important power of liberation, provides us with the ultimate capacity to grasp. So Jaume Agusti calls this the creative hand of human intelligence. There is a strong inter and intradependency between these powers, and a healthy nourishment of, of one's full intelligence needs to tackle all five jointly and harmoniously. An intelligence which is driven by self-interest or based only on information-based communication or reluctant to cooperate in a non-hierarchical way or attached to preconceptions and fixed ideas without further research and inquiry, such intelligence will necessarily be a limited form of intelligence. An intelligence, however, which is driven by compassion and love, based on sincere trust and communion, which is in symbiosis and service with all life forms and sentient beings, always on the path of inquiry, and above all, free, that will be an intelligence at its fullest. So a technoscience that is carried out with a creative hand, with all five powers of intelligence and harmony, and taking into account all its dimensions, functional, axiological, and liberating, is what I call a contemplative technoscience. We should foster much more the scientific culture and the creativity in our society to ensure responsible research and sustainable technological development. And above all, we should foster this freedom at the core of our being and our intelligence. The new paradigm of life is that of living fully from the core of this creative freedom. A new paradigm, but an ancient wisdom. So we read from the gospel. A thief comes only to rob, kill, and destroy. I came so that everyone would have life and have it in its fullest. I don't think that these are words from the past. These are words that I think are ahead of our time. We, we, are, sign, we are techno-scientific societies. And this global pandemic we are going through should help us to deepen the essential values for a life lived at its fullest in these kinds of societies. Values such as widespread and generalized research and inquiry, open communication, sincere cooperation, solidarity, respect and mutual trust, the preservation of diversity, and ultimately the common good. 
However, there is also a risk of coming out of this crisis, wanting to rebuild the world that COVID-19 has shattered. This will certainly be the priority of today's political and economical elites. Let's not be fooled. They, they would like to put this techno-scientific machinery once again at the service of a, of a socio-economic system based on the exploitation of resources and the maximum material benefit only for a few. To rob, to kill, to destroy. We already see signs that once the COVID-19 crisis is over, we may find ourselves living in a world with more authoritarian and repressive states, with a more competitive market, controlled largely by big technology companies, and a society with even greater inequalities. And there are many voices claiming that we need to rethink the fundamental systemic problems of our societies. These are creative voices that speak out of love, of communion, of symbiosis and open inquiry. For example, there is a manifesto signed by 170 Netherlands-based scholars asking that we should move away from development based on GDP growth, that we need to define economic frameworks focused on redistribution and not on accumulation, that we need to foster an, an agricultural transformation towards regenerative ag ag uh, agriculture based on, on biodiversity conservation and sustainable food production, that we need to reduce consumption and travel, promoting sustainable and satisfying forms of this consumption and travel, and asking for the, the debt cancellation for workers and small businesses owners for the countries in the global south. Then there is also a manifesto signed by over 300 social activists and groups asking that we should counter the growing digitization, algorithmification and virtualization of our human experiences and our environment. Because this is a trend that inflicts important ecological and social harm that will threaten the survival and flourishing of billions of people. But my personal feeling is that we need more than that. We need to further deepen the axiological and liberating in dimensions of our techno-scientific practices, of the, of the intelligence that brings techno-science about in the first place. We need to go to the root of our creativity. I believe that the, po the post-COVID-19 world desperately needs to, to be rebuilt on a contemplative technoscience, a science that is, that is practiced from the cultivation of the contemplative, liberating, spiritual, deep human quality dimension. And what can experiential wisdom practices offer to scientists and engineers today to ensure that, that hu this human quality shines through scientific research and technological development? Meditation, attentive reading and listening, loving kindness, communal practice, I don't know, we need to learn how to integrate these wisdom practices in our daily techno-scientific activities so as to make the contemplative dimension of science shine through again. This contemplative techno-science will need to abandon the desire to have everything under control and to remain always open. 
but we need to break up with the logic of growth, this logic based on production and consumption. It will need to see ourselves as uh, receivers of the gift of life with responsibility to take care of it and to know how to pass this gift on to the coming generations. I guess this is of, of utmost importance in the face of the current COVID-19 pandemic because we, we are constantly framing our experience of this pandemic in metaphors of fight, war, and struggle, and, and forget the important role that organisms such as viruses have for the sustainment and evolution of life. This does not mean that we have to abandon our current research to overcome this pandemic and and the suffering it has brought to humanity. But, but we need to situate it also with respect to our role in the wider context of life itself. And we should not leave technoscientists, uh, technoscience in the hand of the elites, which are too much caught up in the frame of power of the current predominant paradigm. We need to find new ways of fostering the collective task of creating a sufficient critical mass of contemplative technoscientists that lead us to those technoscientific societies in which we know how to have life and have it in its fullest. In the sense, contemplative technoscience goes hand in hand with the idea of creative democracies as advocated by the American philosopher John Dewey in the early 20th century. Because ultimately what helps the common good has to be decided by the commons itself. For Dewey, democracy was not something institutional or external, some authority we submit to, but a way of personal and collective living in which the freedom of inquiry, of communication and of cooperation are its foundations, where the experience of the free interaction of the human being with reality, with this absolutely free reality, leads us beyond knowledge, beyond science, opening us continuously to the unexplored and unattainable future. A contemplative, a contemplative technoscience can only flourish in the context of creative democracies. And this relationship may require another whole session in order to reflect on it. But uh, to provide some insight into this relationship and to what I have been trying to convey in these talks about intelligence and the technosciences, let me finish with some quotes by the American philosopher Richard Bernstein on Dewey's uh, creative democracy. Democracy both presupposes and fosters creative individuals. The democratic personality is one that is flexible, fallible, experimental, and imaginative. Without creative imagination and intelligence, individuals lack the resources to deal with novel situations. Ultimately, this type of creativity involves a number of virtues. The courage to experiment, to change opinions in the light of experience. It also requires a genuine respect of one's fellow citizens, a respect and openness that is not simply professed, but concretely exemplified in one's practices. These practices do not arise without the careful cultivation of the habits, skills, and dispositions required for creative activity. Creativity is not something that is limited to special occasions, nor is it restricted to special aesthetic domains. It can, and indeed it ought to be, 
manifested in all human experience and in our everyday practices. Democracy is forever confronted with the task of creating and recreating itself. We cannot appeal to the past or to any preconceived blueprints to deal with the new forms of democratic institutions. Creative democracy is not and cannot be a fixed static ideal. It is intrinsic to the very idea of such a democracy that it is always the task before us, the task that demands passionate commitment and reflective, flexible intelligence. So this path towards uh, creative democracies and towards a contemplative techno-science appears to us a very difficult path to tread. But most likely it's the only path that, that there is. And uh, as the gospel wisdom reminds us, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. You don't miss the point and you don't pull your punches. Thank you very much. I have a few questions just to, to raise with you. Uh, and uh, of course, as before, we invite anyone who's watching these uh, talks to, to send in their comments uh, in the way that's uh, made available so that we can share, share our responses to, to this. And I'm sure, as you say, you're opening up uh, you're opening up a, a broad vision of the future with the choices, difficult choices we have to face. Or, and uh, so we haven't finished the discussion. And in fact, we're already uh, coming together with a group of people who will soon to, uh, to look at ways in which a creative and Functional intelligence can uh, can continue to be applied to these um, to this crisis and to the challenges in the future. So I'm sure you'll you'll want to be part of that. There are there are a few things um, I wanted to ask you though, just coming out of the, this talk. Um, you 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 mentioned how the the algorithm algorithm <laughs> algorithmicalization. I don't know how you managed to get that word out. Uh, the algorithm of the, the algorithms, the tend, the trend of algorithmic uh, control and uh, prediction and control was having uh, an impact upon our ecological um, uh, crisis. How 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 do you see that in in specific? I can understand that the algorithms that that are operating invisibly behind us whenever we whenever yeah. we uh, you know send an email um, and so on you know can control us or eventually um, influence us but uh, how do you see it specifically affecting the ecological crisis yes this is something that maybe is we are not so much aware of it when we when we use all these tools these uh, digital algorithms and digital tools but um, I mean they use a lot of resources in terms of energy and, uh, and also in terms of um, of the, the raw materials that are required to build all these um, these uh, computer systems and uh, if we construct more and more a society that depends on that and that um, needs these amounts of data to train our deep learning algorithms to, to take decisions and so on. We will need more and more data servers that require more and more energy and that need more and more raw materials to be built. And um, this is something that we have to include in the, in the, in the impact that all these technologies have, not only in the, let's say, the the algorithmification of our life and the data that these 
these systems use, but also on the impact on our, our, our environment and how sustainable can be it to have all these um, very digital uh, virtual algorithmic society. Uh, it seems like free that we can do a talk like this over over Zoom and uh, that we do all these searches and uh, on the internet. But I mean, behind that, there are huge data servers and that have to store all these data and have to run all these algorithms. And uh, this has to be also part of the of the whole picture. And we need to be, bring them more and more we have to be more aware of it that that all this has also an ecological in addition to the social uh, impact thank you yes i hadn't thought of that quite in that way before that um, one thinks of the internet and digitalization as being very abstract but they actually use a huge amount of physical resources and energy and if we just think of the uh, the face recognition system that China is is introducing or has introduced very effectively, or the army of um, of observers, you know, watching the internet to uh, to catch people who are having the wrong thoughts. I mean, that that is a huge uh, expenditure of resources and physical resources. So, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, which brings us to. So the next question, which is about abstraction, we think that the internet, one can think that the internet is very abstract and immaterial, whereas in fact it isn't. Um, but you mentioned as part of the, um, the liberating power of intelligence that its function is to, one of its functions is to create the necessary abstractions uh, of perception and of that allow us to to be free from uh, to be free and to change. Could, could you say a, a word about as abstraction as a necessary model or creating necessary models of abstraction and the danger of applying the ab abstract nature of those models? To concrete situations, which usually means that we treat people as if they were uh, figures in our in our model, rather than individuals and human beings. So, okay, we so we need these necessary models of abstraction, but how do we prevent them from becoming not just a model, but actually the reality that we're operating through? Yeah, I think that is this um, this. Two sided, two sides of this liberating intelligence, right? Uh, this, this the, the 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 fact that we can detach from our immediate experience and we create can create these models and these abstractions that is what is the basic principle of scientific inquiry. We need to to build these models, abstract certain aspects, focus on others, and uh, that they help us to do our kind of. Uh, uh, application of this knowledge then to certain technologies and so on. So, so, so this abstraction is required. It is it is basic of scientific research, and it is a result of this liberating intelligence that we have, or this liberating power. At the same time, this liberating power has to help us to see that the the that these are just only abstractions and not the reality itself. So both things, both aspects are important in this. And um, often we just think of our models as the reality itself. We think that the world is made out of atoms and uh, molecules, and um, hmm. and these are human models. These are models created by human intelligence, and uh, they have been very useful for many applications. But uh, they they are just that. They are. They are models, and we should not be get caught in in these to be attached to these models. And that's and that's why cultivating this liberating intelligence and here the wisdom practices can help us is what is necessary to keep these detachment and 
it, and to make it really a, a true detachment and not to get re, attached again to these to these moments. Yes, there's a Desert Father Father saying, "Do not make a passion out of the way you escape from passion." Uh, passion meaning sort of disordered uh, emotions and so don't don't become passionate about the way that takes you beyond passion so maybe applying it to what you've just said is use your intelligence intelligently yeah so all these all this talk of these three days about all these dimensions of intelligence and these powers of intelligence i think it's another model i mean it is if it is useful to move forward and to 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 help us to as a society, then they are welcome. And if not, then we should leave them and look for others, other models or other ideas that can help us forward. So, so we, again, I I don't want to be get attached to the to the terms, to the terminology or the things that I have been expressing in these three talks. I, I've, I've spoken with some doctor uh, friends of mine uh, about the vaccine that's, well, the, the various vaccines which are, which are being uh, released now or being publicized now, and they, they've told me that how impressed they were by the way in which the research was done, and the way that knowledge was was uh, shared uh, mm -hmm. internationally. I don't know if if you. Follow that aspect of it. It's not, you know, epidemi epidemiology is not your your one of your ex expertises. But do you no, get no, the sense that that was a, a, that is the kind of contemplative science that you're talking about? I think there is, as I said, since there is a, a contemplative core in scientific research, it 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 it, it we we see it shining through in some of these. Uh, uh, activities and 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 probably we can find aspects of this contemplative dimension in the research that is done in 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 the COVID uh, vaccines and and it is true there has been a lot of work on sharing data and uh, on reusing the research done by others and all this sharing all this communication uh, and this joint endeavor to to tackle this big problem is I think is very 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 valuable and very nice and it, it it shows that there is this core that is in there, but also this research gets caught up in in the in competition and trying to be the first and in in uh, making a lot of money out of it. It's also caught in there. So so I think um, there is. So seeing this kind of research, we would need to foster and strengthen these contemplative aspects further and be critical about the more uh, economic, competition-oriented uh, things that only put also problems in the, in the development. So, so, so yes, obviously nothing is black or white. I mean, there is something of everything in everywhere, but we should, I think we should foster more this contemplative dimension because that is really this cooperation is what really helps us to, to get out of, of the crisis that we go to. I suppose there is a, there is a kind of healthy competitiveness too. Yes. You know, if, if you are going to run a race and you want to be in really top athletic shape, it's helpful you know, that you're competing with the person running beside you doesn't mean you cheat or you or you um, become too despairing if you lose, but uh, but there's a kind of healthy competitiveness. Saint Benedict says that the that the monks should compete with each other in order to to um, to, to to be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. so there's a kind of healthy competitiveness, maybe, but it's easily corrupted. It's true. Yes. Um, I suppose one one thing because you 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 bring uh, the gospel and obviously your your maybe your sense of uh, the, the, the foundational sense of of your thinking and uh, your your concern expressed in in these talks. 
is uh, connected with your faith and your relationship to to the gospel and to Christ. Do, could you say something about that influence, or is that beyond words? Well, probably that is that is a little bit beyond words, but uh, well, the 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 faith dimension is a dimension that um, also. Um, I wait. Okay, if that, that you may be saved by the bell if you don't if you don't want to answer the question. You don't, you don't feel you have to, but uh, we, can, we can edit it out. But I think it would be interesting to say something about it. If yeah, you I don't know. It's fine. I mean, the, as I said, um, this uh, faith dimension is obviously an important one, and I think for me, it's. Um, it's a, it's a it's a challenge how I integrate that at my personal experience and work as a scientist because uh, um, uh, being a, as being a scientist and uh, dominating view of science in some ways makes me uh, get rid of many of the more mythical or simplistic views of my faith and probably at some at some point of my life i have been uh, getting very much rid of them but at the same time it allows me to to find this more deeper dimension that i am now trying to integrate somehow into my my, my daily life and also in my daily life as a scientist so 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 it is an important aspect in, again in both in, in 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 getting rid of old ideas and and making flourishing new new ways of understanding so so is how i would frame it but it's difficult to express it yeah of course yeah. but i think what you said made me think that the freedom to be able to change the models of reality that we invest ourselves in and that are very useful for for a while until we find better models. Uh, the, the freedom to be able to let go of those models actually is is protected by faith at that level. Deep faith and inquiring faith, you're not sort of trying to measure God or prove God's existence or anything like that, but the inquiry and prayer meditation is, in that sense, an inquiry, not a cognitive, uh, rational inquiry alone. But I mean, meditation, the prayer, the prayer of the heart is itself an investigation and an inquiry and an opening to um, to, to to that to a reality of the truth of the, of the, the nature of reality, and so. If that is at the heart of your one's personal life and is you know, shaped and enriched by, by by faith tradition, then that ought to make you more detached from the models and possessions that we create. Yes, and I guess this absolute freedom uh, is very difficult, and uh, so so. I guess I, we all need, and I, I personally need some kind of tradition or faith system that helps me work on this absolute freedom or, or, or frame it a little bit, because this absolute freedom is very, I probably only privileged minds or privileged persons can live it fully. And um, maybe figures like, Christ have lived it fully, fully, but um, but all of us need our <laughs> need to find some points of support in our tradition and this in, in, in the prayer practices. Or in, um, mm. yeah. uh, so, but but still uh, trying not to get too attached to them. Yeah. Well, Jesus was part of a tradition and lived and died in that tradition but he clearly wasn't wasn't uh, imprisoned by it 
Mm -hmm. Same time. Well, thank you. Uh, we will um, see where we go after this. I'm sure we'll we'll come back and uh, we'll listen to the comments that come in, and we'll continue the conversation in other ways. And I'm sure we'll come back to further conversations like this. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Very enriching, stimulating, and dare I say, intelligent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.